Hi everybody, my name is Matthew Pose with Pose Acoustics and I'm answering questions. So let's get on to the next one. I don't know how to pronounce the name, so I'm just gonna read the question. What are some measurements we should be aiming at for the ultimate home theater? SPL, decay, how much should our response curve be, i.e. plus or minus 3 dB, 5 dB, and at what smoothing on REW? So, first thing, remember, RP22 actually set a set of performance parameters that are best practices for home theater. That document was put, I'm gonna keep referencing it, because that document was put together by folks, essentially a committee of experts on what we should be aiming for. That's what you should be aiming for, because that's what the experts came together and agreed upon. That was the committee agreeing on standards. And some standards already existed, that's what they adopted. Remember that. So I'll get into some specific numbers, but that's the first thing. RP32 is the uh, measurement version of that. It's not out yet, it's coming, I'm on that committee. And that's gonna be the measurement, how you, not how you calibrate, but how do you confirm basically that the system has achieved the results that you, you were aiming for. So let's start with the smoothing idea. There's a lot of people that like to show unsmooth data and they're like, well, it's, it's your, your made your system like naked and it's better. Except that it has nothing to do with what you can hear. It's a completely unrealistic way of looking at the data. And so it's not really helpful because you can have systems that look better than others but actually have much more audible uh, distortions to them than the other system that doesn't look as good. So one of the things that you should probably do Realistically, we should probably be using psychoacoustic smoothing, basically smoothing that varies based on what we know people can hear. Uh, there are some good ones out there, but the ones that are in REW, there's debate about how good those are, um, and there's two different ones that they have. One is actually, I believe, called psychoacoustic smoothing, and then the other one I think is called ERB smoothing. Those are both psychoacoustic smoothing. But they're not bad, and you could use that. Uh, another option is to use 1 6 octave smoothing. That's kind of a decent compromise. Uh, you know, at some frequencies, 1 3rd octave is about as good as the resolution of your hearing will be with mixed content like music and movies. And in other scenarios, you know, 1 12th might be actually more in line with what you could hear. But 1 6 is a, I think, Adam Pels is a friend who's on these committees. I believe he sends me stuff in 1 6 octave, so I think that's what he uses. I mean, that's pretty standard. I think it's reasonable. Unsmooth or like 148 or 124, that's just silly. That's just basically people trying to show off silliness. Um, you, you have to learn how to look through the noise with stuff that's that rough. So let's see what else we got here. Plus or minus 3, 5 dB. I mean, obviously the smoother the better, and it depends on the frequency range. It depends on the Q of the, of the peak. Um, peaks and nulls are different, you know, so a re you could have a minus 30 dB null. And if the Q is like 20, you're not going to hear that. It's just, that's a, basically that's like a cancellation null that's really narrow. It's not audible. On the other hand, you could have a minus 2 dB. It's not a null, but like a trough, let's say. And the Q is 1, you're going to hear that. So it's, it's really not as simple, but I know what you're asking, and I probably would argue for Plus or minus 5 dB is probably a good number to go with. All right, let's see what else we have in here. So I think I kind of answered how smooth the response curve should be. I mean, you don't want any big audible resonances, but it doesn't need to be that smooth. You want to kind of focus on the stuff that's most audible. The problem is it's not just a plus or minus dB thing. You really have to look at the Q and the frequency to understand whether the amplitude level is going to be a problem or not. So what's my recommendation for that? Well, I probably should do some videos on this, but study psychoacoustics, read the papers on the topics, and then incorporate that into your body of knowledge to understand when you're calibrating how to deal with that stuff. All right, decay. So it's really debated, and there are no industry standards that we could say are completely agreed upon as to what the decay rate of the room should be, but I think that most experts would agree that if the room has really long decay times, it's gonna sound very different from rooms that have very short decay times. And if they're too long, it's not gonna be good to the point that it could even cause echo at extreme cases or strong reverberant sound in less extreme cases, but are very, very common. In my personal opinion, I like to use 
a varied approach, meaning that the, so I'm going to stick to RT60 numbers, which we call RDT in the home because RT60, the concept, doesn't apply in a home because there's no reverberant field. So using RDT, in my opinion, smaller rooms will have lower RDT targets than larger rooms. And there's a range of targets that are acceptable to me, and there are numbers that I think are too low for certain sized rooms, and there are numbers I think are too high for certain sized rooms. So my room's around 350 square feet, and in a room like that, which is relatively small to modest for a home theater, I would typically target between 0.25 at the lowest end and 0.35 at the upper end for an RDT time. And I would probably would prefer to be in the middle. But people have different tastes, and there's definitely going to be people who like it at the upper end or the lower end. It also is normal to be higher at low frequencies than it is in the mid frequencies for the RDT. The decay rate of decay uh, would basically be slower, have a higher RDT time. And in, that ca and in, in that range, I don't have a particular number. I kind of keep it within a certain range, but I like to see that stay under half a second, 0.6 seconds, something like that in a room like this. In larger rooms, I might go higher, but again, like at the low frequencies, I got no problem with that being really low, and I'd like to keep it low. So um, one of the things, though, is I don't look as much at the number. I do look at the number. It matters to me. But I really look at the smoothness of the number. What I really want to see is for that number to be really flat and smooth across a large... I want to be able to measure... I have, you know, three seats here, three seats there. I want to be able to measure in every seat and in between all those seats and get basically the same numbers, or very close to the same numbers at every frequency. If I'm not getting that, then the room's got problems because it means it's going to sound different at different seats. So decay, I mean, those are kind of the targets, but like I said, it varies. All right, SPL. Um, so I understand there's people who feel that reference is too loud, and they don't like when I push the idea that a system needs to be capable of producing reference levels and, up and beyond. You know, I want some margin. I'm just going to say that is my standard. That is the RP22 standard, and I don't have another standard to go by. When I listen to movies at levels below, and I do it all the time, but at levels below reference, I do feel that there's a compromise. I'm not hearing the artistic intent. There's stuff that's lost, even in my very low noise floor. And the dynamics don't have the same oomph and impact that they're supposed to have. So things get lost. I have clients come over. In fact, I had this interesting case. A client came over. I think he, he's probably going to watch this video because I think he found me through YouTube. And he wanted to hear my speakers. Um, he had something else. He wasn't very happy with it. And he wanted to hear what I had so he could make a decision about whether he was going to upgrade or not. He came over with his wife. They took a listen. And uh, to be honest, it was a little bit of a disaster. I, there was some stuff like my uh, uh, tops, my Atmos tops were not working. And I didn't realize it at first. I've, I've actually been having issues where the amplifier clicks on like the light is on, but it's not actually passing sound. And it's not super obvious always. So I had run some tests earlier. I had made sure it was working and then it must have clicked off or gone off or something. So didn't realize we're doing, he's listening. He's like, that's eh, not that immersive. And I'm, to be honest with you, I was listening thinking, it doesn't sound quite right, but I'm not sure. So I reset it thinking that fixed it, but it didn't. And we went through some more demos and we specifically put on a track to hear a helicopter flying overhead from the Dolby disc. And it was very obvious that there was only bass. And it's like, okay, something's wrong. Reset it again, got it working, re-listened to some stuff. In the process of all of that, one of the things I did was he was keeping the volume level pretty low. And I said, well, let me, let me control things a little. And I put on specific content that I knew was good at highlighting what the system does well. And I turned the volume up. I didn't actually go to reference levels on purpose because I knew that he and his wife would not want that. But we went to like, we were at like minus 20, we went to like minus six. And all of a sudden, he was wowed. And the thing that wowed him was not that we finally got the tops working. It was that he realized how much of a compromise turning the volume down caused. And once we turned it up, changed everything. So he goes home, listens to his system, and he turns it way up. And he calls me, or he emailed me, and he says, I think I've decided. I'm not going to get new speakers, and I want to spend the money. Because actually, it, it, just by turning it up, I made, it made a huge difference. And if anything, I'm probably going to hire you to come in and do a calibration, because I think a calibration and listening at more appropriate levels is all I need. And that is true. I mean, yeah, I lost a sale on it, but let's be realistic here. I don't do this just for the money. I want people to, I mean, these videos make next to nothing. 
the whole purpose of doing this is to try to help people understand better what it takes to achieve artistic intent, like the RP22 document goal was. One of them is you got to listen loud, and if you can't, you got to accept that that's a compromise. So, how loud should the, sh should the system be capable of? Well, once you've gotten everything set, and you've got it set so that you know what reference levels are, the system needs to be able to do 105 dB from each speaker at the listening position. At a bare minimum, the LCRs have to do that. The surrounds, if they're about 3 dB below that, not the end of the world, but Realistically, I'd like those doing 105 dB as well. Usually the way it's argued is it's either the speaker or an array of speakers. So if you've got multiple side surrounds because you've got multiple rows, each one doesn't have to do it as long as the collective group can do it. Now in RP22, we set that up based on anechoic measurements. You're going to get some gain in a room, so you actually get some boost. Which What that means is that if you calculate it per RP22, you automatically get a couple dB of margin, which is great. But if you're going to measure it, and it technically can be measured, you just have to understand how to measure it, then uh, that, those are the targets that I would be going for. And realistically, like I said, I'd like some margin. I'd like the system to be able to do that without compression, without significant rise in distortion, to around 108 dB. And that is from around 120 hertz and above. Below 120 hertz, I really want 115 dB, with some margin. I'd really like around 118 to 120 dB, all the way down to 20 hertz and below. Now, that's actually hard to test, and I don't want to have this video turned into how you do that, including for RP32, we're still debating that, and I'd like to let that get settled before we kind of come back with a number here. But, you know, once we have settled that, I think it'll be easier for us to kind of give everybody some guidance on how to do this, but basically, Remember the numbers I said, your subs are only working from 80 hertz down to and below, but I said 120 hertz and below, because actually when you, LFE channel is not 80 hertz and below. LFE channel is all the way up to like 120, 150. It's however they use it. It's just a, it's just a channel, and the content has stuff, content that gets above that. And that channel is supposed to be able to do 115 dB. What that means is your collective speakers, because it gets redistributed amongst all your speakers, need to be able to hit that number. Well, you get random, uh, you get, uh, you're not getting coherent. It, it's not fully coherent, all the speakers, because they're in the room all over the place. So you're only getting about 3 dB per doubling of speakers. If at 120 hertz, you're limited to 105, let's just say for the sake of argument, and I don't, I'm going to use my phone because I have a little app that I use for this kind of thing. So we're going to redistribute it over, we're going to say the bed layer is the only one that matters. And we're, we're just going to say at that frequency, all of them can do 105 dB. We're going to make our lives e easier here. So we've got one, two, three, I have seven. What am I doing? So the first one, I'm going to use an app where I can collectively add the speakers. Random phase, because they're not all coherent in phase. Seven speakers gets us to 113.5 dB. So we haven't hit that number yet. But remember, I said I like a little bit of margin there. So if we change the front speakers to say they can do 108, that gets us to 115 on the nose, putting a little bit more emphasis on those LCRs. So there's that kind of transition frequency area where you need to make sure the speakers can do it. Interestingly enough, there's two areas where most speakers fail to reach reference levels. One is the tweeter. Most, if you have a speaker that is like a couple of drivers with a tweeter and there's no waveguide or horn on it, the likelihood that that thing can do 105 dBs is like nil. It, I'm not going to say it's completely impossible and there's no way, but there are very, very few dome tweeters without a waveguide that can do that. So the vast majority of speakers based on that are limited. But let's just say it was crossed up high enough that the low end of the tweeter isn't compromised. There is a strong argument that you don't need to do 105 dB at 20 kilohertz. In fact, the signal... And I think, again, RP32 is debating this, so we need to kind of figure out what the stimulus signal would be. But if you were to use the pink noise signal, the shaped pink noise signal specifically, that was adopted by CTA in the CT, uh, CTA 2034 document, that's a compression test. That shaped signal has the treble rolled off, which puts less energy in the highest of frequencies, which better mimics music. M noise would be another test signal you could do this with. It's, it's supposed to very closely mimic music, but I think one of the problems is the 105 dB thing came from the use of pink noise. 
So I'm kind of dubious on sw simply switching over to M noise and saying, because they don't give you the same number. But anyway, let's just say we use the shape pink noise from uh, CTA. Then I think you probably are not going to have issues at the highest frequencies. It's going to be more the base range where you're going to have limitations. But in the tweeter, one of the problems you often have is that if you've crossed that tweeter over to a point where you've got good directivity match to the mid-bass drivers, then you're going to have this issue where um, you're going to have like a, some compression forming around the crossover point. So that's one of the common areas we have problems. The other area where you commonly have problems is in the bass. And a lot of people will assume that because they've got, I don't know, a whole bunch of five inch drivers or something like that, surely it must be, I mean, bass at 80 hertz is nothing, right? But actually a lot of speakers hit their max and start compressing often not just at 80 hertz, it's like well above, all the way up to 100, 150 hertz. And you could cross it higher, but then you're gonna have other sound quality issues. I mean, at some point you just have to add like mid-bass modules to each one um, to compensate for that. So you gotta do the tests, make sure you're not getting compression. There needs to be a distortion confirmation test that's done because while the compression test should naturally, I mean, once you get around three dBs of compression, you're typically starting to approach 10% THD. It's not a given. So I think it's worth checking the distortion and making sure that you're within a reasonable number. I also think 10% distortion is kind of extreme. I, for a high performance system, would prefer to see less than 3% at the upper end of where we're using it, which again is why I like to see a little bit of headroom. It just keeps us out of that. So when I design a system, because I don't know what it's gonna do, I'll typically design in at least three or four dB of headroom. In my own system, there's more than six dB of headroom in it, uh, which I did on purpose. Um, I wanted to make sure that there was no way I was anywhere near when it was going to start compressing. All right, what else do we have here? So I think I covered it. All right. Well, I hope that was helpful. And uh, thanks for watching these videos. I'll keep doing them in the future.